even the top 1% of hours on the grid. They account for over 15% of the costs and over 15% of emissions um, for the whole year, just, just during that top 1%. If you can clip that top 1% of hours, that's one of the greenest things you can do, both economically and monetarily, but also from you know, the environmental standpoint. The cleanest megawatt is, is the megawatt that's never produced. Behind the global exahash of the Bitcoin monetary network is Bitcoin mining. And behind that is energy, which is why I'm so excited to have on Cam Tower from C Power. Cam, how are you doing? Doing well, Jared. Thanks for having me on the show today. Thanks for hopping in. Let's just dive right into energy. So if you could maybe give an intro to yourself and also talk a little bit uh, about C Power and, you know, and energy. Sure. I'm simply an energy nerd. I've been working at Sea Power for almost eight, almost nine years now. Um, and we are the nation's leader um, in virtual power plant development. We have been a leader in traditional demand response, reducing demand when the grid gets stressed. And now we're moving with the industry and with the grid to provide more flexible and dynamic products and value added technology to the grid and in turn generating revenue for our clients. You know what? I, I hadn't thought about, you know, in, in the mind's eye, we have some questions we kind of want to get through, but this just occurred to me. I'm assuming that you got into C power and then in your journey being with C power, cause you said eight or nine years, did you then get into Bitcoin? Were you introduced to Bitcoin through basically the energy side of it or were you already uh, you know, aware of Bitcoin before you got into C power and how did that, you know, how was that? Once again, this just occurred to me just because, just because the timing, I think it's always interesting to talk about people's Bitcoin journey and how they get into Bitcoin. Uh, some people come into Bitcoin strictly from an investment. Some people come into Bitcoin as a way for figuring out how to send cross-border payments. They just kind of stumbled into it. Some people get into Bitcoin maybe through energy. And so, yeah, I, I kind of wanted to, to ask, was it energy and then Bitcoin or was there Bitcoin and then you kind of got into energy? Sure. Um, so, so I'm a finance guy by education. So I've been aware of the blockchain, Bitcoin and, and other um, alternative assets for a handful of years um, now. At C Power, I started off in our, our back office, energy markets, financial roles, managing operations. Um, and now I manage our partnerships, specifically our Bitcoin data centers and HPC partnerships. While I was in my younger days at C Power, I'd sit on the floor at the office with a handful of guys that were also um, quants. And we'd talk from you know everything from college football to the NBA to Bitcoin. And that's where we really started to um, peel back the onion, dive a few layers deeper into what is Bitcoin, coming up with use cases on how this could be a useful grid resource here domestically and play into our business. And a few years, a year later, we started to see the miners move out of China and into upstate New York. And that's kind of, you know, domino tips. And a few years later, we're in the position we are now. So I've probably was an energy nerd first and then started to uh, learn more about Bitcoin. And now I'm you know, a fan and it's landed me in the position I am now. Well, that's super cool because I think you're in a short list of people who I know who maybe got into Bitcoin vis-a-vis -vis energy. Energy brought them into Bitcoin, which is great. Um, and now focusing on energy, if you could, could you just kind of give us like a where we are in energy and maybe where we've been since you joined C Power? And I say that because not only do we have HPC, do we have AI demand that is really if you if you're into Bitcoin mining, you're highly aware now of AI demand. We just put out an article out or we're going to put putting an article out by the time that this is published uh, by Anthony Power talking about core scientific and how they're starting to even uh, look into AI as a component of their overall fleet. So we have all this new demand, HPC, Bitcoin, AI, however you want to package that compute. How is that? playing into the overall demands of the energy grid, which the story in my head is that they're going to continue to grow just as production grows, just as more people are in the United States, et cetera, et cetera. So if you could kind of set up where energy has been over the last 10 years and then maybe flow into how Bitcoin, uh, Bitcoin mining plays a part into the grid and, and you know, how it 
that relationship, I guess. So one, the, the demand for electricity has been growing recently, something that we didn't necessarily see for the larger pat, part of the past decade. Efficiency improvements, the pandemic had some impact on, on demand. Um, but with new technologies, new industries like mining and especially the HPC and growth of even traditional data centers, we're seeing a lot more need for power on the grid. And I don't think anyone's surprised that these um, disruptive emerging industries like mining, HPC compute, um, are gonna move a lot quicker than the utilities. So there's not necessarily gonna be several new gigawatts po popping up in every county, new state that have, you know, available to interconnect right away. And that's where you know, the need for, in addition to new power plants, virtual power plants can be extremely advantageous to the grid, the and the local community in addition to you know the, the private business that's that's offering their services to be included in a virtual power plant so if the grid is you know quote unquote the grid is constantly balancing the electricity and or all the utilities in their footprint in real time a kilowatt produced essentially needs to be consumed in real time um and they're always balancing equilibrium if it's uh, a heat wave in august on that third day of the heat wave, the grid will add an, ask another peaker plant to turn on. You know, a natural gas plant, you'll continue to add some additional supply into the equation, into the system, in order to keep the system at equilibrium. That afternoon, more folks come home from work, turn on, you know, turn their AC down a couple degrees, you'll need some more supply plant plants um, to turn online to meet that demand, that peaking demand for those hours. Those top even the top 1% of hours on the grid, they account for over 15% of the costs and over 15% of emissions um, for the whole year, just, just during that top 1%. So if you can cleanly, if you can clip that top 1% of hours, that's one of the greenest things you can do, both economically and monetarily, but also from you know, the environmental standpoint. The cleanest megawatt is, is the megawatt that's never produced. So sea power, we, we essentially play Tetris. We're looking at all of these different blocks, these different resources on the grid, whether you're a Bitcoin miner, a traditional data center in Ashburn, Virginia, a middle school, a grocery store. Sea power works with, if you went and bought groceries this morning, you're probably bought it from a sea power customer. If you went and bought lumber from a retailer, probably from a sea power customer. Chances are, you know, we work with school districts and are monetizing both the building automation system and the lights and HVAC at the high school, but also the electric school buses that are shuttling kids around. Anywhere there's a resource, we can productize it and provide that to the grid. Um, so by aggregating all of these different loads, resources, the backup generator at the co-location data center, turning off 10% of lighting at a Walmart, Target, Home Depot, some refrigeration loads, um, or a miner, turning down, you know, in six seconds, five minutes in order to meet a dispatcher, a signal from the grid. We package all of these Tetris blocks essentially and provide the same products and reliability to the grid that a, a gas plant, a, a traditional peaker plant does, but we are just a, a virtual peaker, an aggregation of um, loads and resources that we productize and package to the grid in order to monetize. There's a, the, a long-winded answer on uh, kind of the evolution from heat wave. You'd pick up the phone and call the steel mill to shut down for two hours. Now it's you know becoming that IoT of the grid where we're dynamically looking to see are there price spikes, are there supply and demand imbalances, and as we see different market signals on the grid and in these different programs and regions, those represent different opportunities for different customers and present an extremely material opportunity for our Bitcoin mining partners. I was gonna say that the Tetris example was great because I am a visual person and I grew up playing Tetris and many people understand that and how things are gonna fit in in the blocks. And so I wanna go back to what you said and I wanna make sure I understand it because this is pivotal. You're saying that when demand is peak, let's say demand is at 100%, to get 101%, to get that extra 1%, by asking a natural gas peaker to basically turn on to provide energy to the grid to, to, to 
cover that 1%. You're saying that could be up to 15 to 20% of emissions by having to do that. Is that right? And costs. That and last, cost. That last okay. peaker plant, that gas plant is staffed 365 days a year. It's not running the other 360 days a year for obvious reasons. It's dirty, it's expensive, but it's still there in case you need it. It's receiving those capacity payments in case it's needed, but it's only producing energy a handful of hours a year. Rather than pay that resource to be staffed, be you know everything, that's terribly inefficient. Mm -hmm. You let's go pay the Bitcoin miner, the all the data centers in. DFW, Northern Virginia, Chicago. Let's go aggregate a thousand retail stores, some, you know, other steel mills are f phenomenal resources. So, the, but data centers, HPC, Bitcoin miners are, they're already there. If you build it, they've already come. So let's, let's take ad advantage of their, their grid capabilities and allow them to be a resource for the community rather than you know just someone who's sucking kilowatt hours. This is great. And I really thank you for, for explaining that because no one's actually ever explained basically curtailment in that way. So what you're saying is we're at 100%. All the energy is being used, it's being produced. All of a sudden, there's 1% more demand. So instead of going to the peaker, which we've talked about is unbelievably inefficient, to just keep it basically, you know, the uh, relief pitcher warming up in the bullpen for 360 days a year for five days, right? Just for five days of playing. Let's go ahead and let's ring up or, you know, I guess we would say the old way would be ring up the Bitcoin mine that's down the street and say, hey, could you turn off for the next hour and a half? So that way we can still have the same amount of energy that we're producing satisfy demand. Is that explained properly? Yeah, we're, we're keeping the system in equilibrium and... Simple economics, you can add one marginal unit of supply or reduce one marginal unit of demand. And so we're calling up the miner in Texas and boom, five minutes later, there's 150 megawatts off the grid. And that's alleviating, that, that's such a, a valuable um, move by, by that miner for the grid and for their community. They're becoming a sustainable member of their community while monetizing their costs, their demand charges and their load. And being a flexible resource that can respond to grid needs and reduce their bottom line too. We, we have some that, customers that, uh, you know, they have, they have SLAs, they need to be hashing at all times or in the HPC data or Colo world, they have SLAs they need to um, attend to. And so they're only curtailing a handful of hours a year. We have other you know, self miners that if the signals are there and I'm going to yield more from the grid than I will from hashing, I'll, every time I exceed that break even point, I'm going to curtail. And we've had instances, not this past month, but other times where a miner is curtailed for 30% of the hours in that month and that the value they derived from curtailing was able to offset the costs associated with mining the other 70 hours, 70% 70 of hours that month. This is one of the best explanations of curtailment that I've heard. And we recently put out a kind of educational video about curtailment. And I almost kind of want to go back and edit that a little bit because I think in the educational video, one of the things we out, well, sorry, we outlined two things that were benefits to Bitcoin miners. One is that we're going to get potentially better power agreements. Uh, you know, we'll have more competitive rates. And then the other one is that we'll be able to help out the local grid. But I think one of the things that maybe we left off from that is the environmental benefit of what you just said. The best, the most, uh, you know, environmentally friendly, essentially kilowatt is the one that you don't need to produce. The one that you basically just ask people to kind of, if it's uh, musical chairs, to give up their chair for five minutes so somebody else can sit and then they get their chair back. Right. Um, and that is something that now having you know heard your explanation, I, I just think it's wonderful. And one of the things I think we definitely wanted to touch on today, now knowing that, knowing that the flexible load of Bitcoin mining, could you talk about then the difference between maybe Bitcoin mining and some of the other uh, server centers, data centers, even AI, uh, some of the other HPC and maybe how those different as far as a flexible and an inflexible load? Definitely. Um, and perhaps I couple this answer with a little bit of a story or kind of talk you through the evolving landscape of compute and high performance compute and with respect to the grid and grid services. 
So C Power, we've been working with co-location traditional enter enter enterprise data centers for over a decade. Um, we've worked with large commercial industrial loads for over a decade. Um, those loads, they're energy intensive loads in you know DFW, Chicago, outside of New York and Jersey, Columbus, Ohio, Northern Virginia. They are not able to be, they're not able to easily curtail or turn down like a Bitcoin miner or a arc furnace at a steel mill. So they're transitioning over to their backup generators. And so they're part of the virtual power plant. They're monetizing the nameplate capacity of their diesel and natural gas generators in the backyard. They're moving 30 megawatts off the grid to run locally for a handful of time and then alleviating, pu putting that back on the grid like in the musical chairs example when you know they can have their chair back after a handful of minutes. Um, these are wonderful grid resources. They're large, but they're not terribly flexible. They're good resources, not fully wonderful. C Power noticed this, and you know we were driving, you know, had several hundred megawatts of data centers and other large loads in our portfolio, and we're looking for a way to make that more flexible. We went out to the market in the late 2010s looking for some flexibility software, didn't find exactly what we wanted, and started to develop it in house. That's called Enterwise. It's our AI-enabled site optimization solution. And right as this um, started to, you know, we were rolling it out, going to market and trying to find some use cases for it, that's when the miners started to move out of China and into the United States. So this mining opportunity, we, we put our ducks in a row, but to be honest, part, part of this opportunity landed in our lap. Um, we were well positioned to do so, but we were then able to take our some of our competencies in the data center space and move that over with some software solutions and flexibility um, expertise and start taking these large loads that are inherently flexible and providing guidance and solutions from and providing opportunities from the grid. We've also been able to partner with some you know, phenomenal minor management solutions as well to automate this and provide even more fidelity and um, reducing some risk and in, in their performance in, in grid services. So we've seen across the board going from grid stress, pick up the phone, can you, you know, that's your grandparents' demand response. And now over the handful of years, the grid's been placing a premium on flexibility and these miners, in addition to some other industries, have been just one of the best grid services profiles that a utility or grid operator can ask for. And then moving into the H, we've seen, you know, like a lot of folks that are in the mining space, we've seen um, the next evolution shifting towards HPC, AI data centers and high performance compute. We're seeing some of our data center facilities, or excuse me, some of our mines starting to diversify their business operations and include some HPC or GPU and AI compute customers. Um, these are also great grid services resources. They're going to have, there, there's a handful of different flavors of demand response. If you're in New York, Texas, PJM, MISO, there's going to be energy, ancillary, capacity programs. Um, and there's a different fit. If you have, if you're self mining versus hosting, if you're writing index versus, you know, if you're hedge, there's different nuances based off of what program you'll fall into. And that HPC load profile and their appetite for curtailment is going to likely fall somewhere in between that traditional data center and that Bitcoin miner. Perhaps they're set up for some day ahead programs. That was a kind of long winded answer on how we've you know moved from compute on the grid to now more flexible compute. Um, the Enterwise solution is actually the coolest thing on the market right now. We're able to look at energy capacity and ancillary opportunities and and costs like transmission and capacity charges on, on your bill as well, and optimize across those different column opportunities throughout the day. You could earn $5 in the morning, then $10 in the afternoon in this program, but once in a blue moon, maybe you save $50. Those are all round numbers, but we have the logic um, and the expertise and bake into account all of your, all of the miners constraints, and we're able to come up with an optimized solution that you know, in, in some markets, we're deriving north of $100,000 per megawatt 
annually for, for these miners. So there's a lot of value to be had by collaborating. So knowing all of this, uh, the flexibility and the inflexibility, it seems that Bitcoin mining, when it comes to its relationship or symbiotic relationship that it can have with the grid to curtail when demand is high. And I think the giving up the chair seems pretty, pretty salient if we're going to use an analogy. Why is there potentially or maybe not why is there when you sit down with power providers around the country? Uh, and maybe they're not into Bitcoin mining or maybe they don't have Bitcoin mining in their region or locally. Um, is there still apprehension now knowing the symbiotic relationship that can exist between uh, the power generators and Bitcoin miners? Uh, and if so, what are ways that you're able to easily cross that chasm in like 30 seconds to a minute? Because it almost seems like energy grids would want to you know, welcome Bitcoin mining to almost all reaches, obviously, of the country. And I say that with the small caveat of obviously energy is more expensive in certain places in the country than it is in others. And Bitcoin mining just can't be profitable everywhere. I'm currently up in Massachusetts, where I think in my local town, it's like 22 cents a kilowatt. So if there's a Texan listening to this, who's here's that he may faint. Uh, but um, yeah, you know, other than maybe be, being cost prohibitive, I guess the real question is, why isn't Bitcoin mining everywhere knowing that it can have such a great relationship uh, with the grid? Good question. Um, so our, the, the industry definitely has a cloud over it at some times. And I think that's starting to subside, subside to some respect. Um, and utilities are warming up to the idea of miners as well. Where th this kind of comes down to a regulated versus deregulated conversation. You have on-grid miners in deregulated markets that are participating in demand response programs that are um, providing value to the grid. There's regulated places where the utilities are trying to cut deals with these miners, bring them in. You can get a sweetheart deal on your supply, but you're going to be on an interruptible rate. And so we're going to have control over you and be able to call you during peak times, whether you're in TVA or... Um, Montana, Dakota, Wyoming, you know, somewhere up north. We're seeing in municipalities and cooperatives and some smaller, call it utility jurisdictions, um, that this is starting to happen. Folks are bringing in five megawatt loads because they're uh, adding a Bitcoin miner or two is really going to improve the economies of scale for that for that cooperative or that municipality, that village, um, and so they can consume excess KWH when it's available and they're not going to be consuming when it's not. It's the perfect load for for that small utility and it helps lower the the cost for the ratepayers by maybe 5% throughout the whole the whole region due to, you know, the economies of scale in which they're able to procure. We've seen whether you're in Texas, there's a handful of cooperatives that C Power partners with to successfully monetize those loads and provide value to ERCOT there. We're seeing a lot in MISO, the mid uh, mid continent independent system operator, PJM with AMP, American Municipal Power, primarily in Ohio, Pennsylvania, some other states. We're starting to see some wonderful partners and customers move loads out out of First Energy AEP into some of these um, municipalities and cooperatives those IOUs still have a lot of load. And we're seeing the same thing in upstate New York. You have your customers behind National Grid, but you have customers behind city of so-and-so. And so two years ago, this has probably had a bigger cloud over it, but now we're starting to see the, the proof is in the pudding. There's been cases and examples to point to from upstate New York down to ERCOT and PJM in between. And more and more folks are listening and they're seeing, you know, this pencils, this model's out and it's going to, that old Alcoa plant is still there. The, the infrastructure is still there. Let's bring a new industry in that's going to provide a handful of jobs. Um, but more importantly, reduce rates for all, all the rate payers and improve reliability. That's where we're you know, productizing this and providing the same reliability and products that a, a, peak or a traditional power plant can, can provide capacity, energy, and ancillary services. You had mentioned ERCOT, and I'd recently had on Lee Bratcher from the Texas Blockchain Council. And one of the stats that he had, which 
is interesting, right? Is that stateside, 40% of Bitcoin mining happens in Texas. Now, this may even be higher. This is data that's based off basically what we're seeing from the public miners because they have to you know, share that publicly. Obviously, there's miners like Compass and other miners that aren't public but are mining in Texas. And so you mentioned ERCOT. My question is moving forward because I do think Bitcoin mining obviously moves to where the energy is, right? Um, now, as you've just laid out, that can change and there can be flux. But on the whole, I think that that's probably a, a generalization that's OK to make. Do you think that based on ERCOT and based on where the energy is, do you think that Texas is going to continue to grow its kind of share of stateside Bitcoin mining activity? Or do you think that there's other regions in the country that are maybe going to start to pull some of that share away from Texas just due to their energy setup? Good question. Um, I, I don't think Texas is going to lose their lead anytime soon, if ever. Whether they continue to increase their share domestically, that's a little tougher to answer. I think that there's going to continue to be opportunities pop up throughout the country, whether that's in Ohio, Pennsylvania, throughout only certain parts of MISO are deregulated. And kind of to our, our last little conversation, we're seeing a lot of deregulated portions of MISO states have their cooperatives and municipalities. You know, they aren't subject to the PUC of that state, so we can they can therefore opt in and bring a mine in to participate in MISO's curtailment pr programs. Um, so I think there's going to be more opportunities arising throughout the country, but I think the landscape in Texas um, is still inviting, not just for miners, but for HPC load into the future as well. Yeah, and. That's what I've heard from most people. And I just wanted to check in and make sure that there wasn't something that that was kind of being missed there. You had also mentioned the China ban, which obviously changed overnight, I think, even the way that Texas kind of grew and, and how many miners went there and just the United States obviously benefited from that China ban. And I'm not sure, you know, this is just strict curiosity. What does, you know, are there challenges that the rest of the world has when it, when it comes to moving forward with energy that maybe the U.S. doesn't have and vice versa? And how is regulation and policy kind of working? And I guess as a larger kind of umbrella to that, it's like as the U.S. moves forward, we know that we're going to continue to have a higher energy demand. And so like, are we as the United States positioning ourselves competitively to be able to be a place that looks, um, you know, like a good place to set up mining as opposed to maybe other countries? That's a, that's a big question. Um, it is a big question. I, I figured so, I'd throw it out there because we had mentioned the China van. We'd just gone through Texas. But I think it's important because as mining grows, um, I think whether they're public companies or whoever they are, you know, uh, South America and Africa are, are starting to see some interest in mining. And so I'm just always kind of interested. And the story in my head is it goes back to competitive power rates, right? Like yeah. that is what you need as a Bitcoin miner, like to start before anything else, let's start there and move forward. And so I wonder if other countries are going to try to make it, it you know, build more incentive for maybe stateside miners to diversify their, their, uh, I guess I could call it their fleet, but you know, into other places. Sure. Um, I think the United States is still going to be a strong spot to to host this computing load moving forward. I think where you see opportunities throughout the globe, like you alluded to, is you know, there's stranded hydro or there's cheap, there's cheap resources that are, are not fully utilized. And that provides an opportunity to maintain the Bitcoin network and derive some revenue while, while doing so. In the United States, there's opportunities like that as well. But we also have relatively cheap on-grid power compared to areas like Europe, for instance, or you know, places like China where you're not allowed to mine anymore or legally. So I, I think there's going to continue to be opportunity in the US and there's still going to be opportunity in d developing areas like you mentioned. It might not be as robust in a deregulated locality that's participating in aggregated grid services, but I think there's going to be excess capacity you know, around the world, whether that's flared gas or, you know, at a, at a nuke or a hydro facility in front of the meter and capturing or, you know, co-locating with wind and being able to offload negative pricing so that those intermittent renewables don't have to uh, improve the economics on intermittent renewables, simply put. One other point to your question is I think we're, the world's going to continue to grow and the demand for power, like you alluded to, is outpacing the 
demand for or the pace of supply as well. And we've seen the grid start to place a premium on flexibility services. And I think we're going to continue to see that as more and more programs are popping up where you, know, you can even push a battery back into the grid. You can, there's a virtual power plants are, are here and they're here to stay. And they're going to become more and more valuable as there's utility decisions, infrastructure decisions. You know, you can save one report was 15 to $35 billion on infrastructure costs for utilities just up until 2030 that, you know, optimally deploying virtual power plants will help offset those costs. And our grid is speaking domestically here. You know, it's, it's old and, um, has its challenges, particularly in some areas. And I think these flexibility services are going to, one, they're a material and integral plan for any miner's energy strategy, but two, they're going to be very important for localities moving forward. Yeah. You've just talked about basically increasing efficiency. It's like as the demand outpaces supply, how is sea power and others thinking about ways to continue to maintain efficiency? When, you know, there's more people, let's go back to the chairs analogy. There's more people trying to sit down than there are chairs and knowing that the efficiency not only saves money, but it can be a really good thing for the environment. Yeah. So sea power, we manage north of seven gigawatts of capacity. So in, in aggregation, we are 130 to 150 peter plants available at, at the U.S.'s disposal, essentially. Um, so as demand grows and supply will grow as well. Um, like we mentioned before, we're gonna have to lean on on these types of clean, reliable resources even more. Sea power, what was the metric last year? I think we avoided close to 400,000 metric tons of CO2, and um, which was equivalent to not burning close to 450 million pounds of coal. It's like 430 million pounds of coal, if, if I recall correctly. So I imagine these metrics are going to continue to to climb, but um, more important than those particular metrics, you know, we're going to have to be dispatching our resources, th those different Tetris blocks that, you know, some of them are longer, some of them are taller, but we, we're going to put those puzzle pieces together. And over the past year, we've been, you know, had just under a, a, a thousand dispatches, you know, a, a, around two a day. I think we're going to see that those numbers continue to increase as there's going to be more need for these resources bidding into programs and providing value on, you know, a, a day in day out basis. Hitting those expensive hours in the afternoon for certain resources is really going to optimize their energy strategy, save on unnecessary costs while generating some revenue. Yeah. And that goes along with uh, one of the stats that you had sent over before we hopped on to record. And I want to call that out. It said in a single year, our customers helped grid operators balance the grid 675 times. That's nearly two events a day and relieved 14.5 gigawatts of load from the grid. It also said that, or, you know, the stat you said also said from 2017 to the end of 2023, we saw 124% increase in events. I assume that that's going to continue as we move into the future and demand uh, increases, right? Exactly. That, that goes along with kind of what we've been talking about, how this is trending. We're going to, demand is going to keep outpacing supply. So those metrics will keep increasing. And this is valuable. During that same time period, PJM or C Power has paid out over a billion dollars to our customers, our Bitcoin miners, to our middle schools for participating in these programs. And the premiums that the grid is placing on these these they're increasing the incentives that they're that they need from flexibility services and so i think these miners and these middle schools and data centers are going to start you know generating billions of dollars a year in grid services and through their vpp potential that's awesome i mean that's that's great to see and i know as you know for us as bitcoin miners like i said one of the things in curtailment is you're going to get more competitive energy prices when you sign up to basically play play well in the sandbox, right? Play well with your local grid. Changing 
a little bit, changing themes a little bit here. You were recently at Mining Disrupt, and I wanted to ask your overall thoughts uh, from an energy standpoint. Were there other energy people there? Did you kind of feel like you were alone? Uh, did you see anything new, any new products? I know that there's a lot of new uh, launches and new ASICs coming out seemingly every week this summer between Mining Disrupt and the Bitcoin conference. Yeah, but Mining Disrupt was last week. It was a good time down in Miami. Sea Power, we hosted a wonderful happy hour with our esteemed partner, Foreman, OBM. They, uh, I'm sure everyone's familiar with them, the leading miner management solution. We met up with a handful of our other miner management platforms, Load by Lincoin and Medi, Hyvon, It's Miner, Crater. We're integrated with Oridine, who was there, and some other folks that were working on integrations. So it was wonderful from, you know, sitting down and meeting with our customers face-to-face, some of our partners, seeing some prospects that we've been talking to, but haven't yet formally enrolled them into a grid services program. So that was that was great to show face and, and be around in the industry. This was C-Power's, this is my third or fourth time down in Miami for Disrupt. And I've been down there for other mining and energy events. And we did see an uptick. Um, in some ener- other energy players there over the past few years, um, you know, Sea Power has been entrenched in this space, and I, you know, we're all on the same team. It's kind of nice to see some some more folks from from my side of the table entering the conversation as well. So there there were a handful of other players there too this year. Yeah, and as you are heading up partnerships for Sea Power, as you look ahead at Nashville, which is now only weeks away. What are particular partnerships you're you're looking at? And you know, if people are there and they run into you, what what are the conversations that you're really hoping to have uh, in Nashville? Simply put, if you're an on-grid miner in a deregulated territory within the United States, we should be having a conversation. There's dollars to be had that are probably being left on the table right now. And so, one of our objectives in Miami and was in Miami and going to be in Nashville is to strengthen those existing relationships with our on-grid mining partners and find some new ones. Where we're really having some success now is we're the market maker, we're the avenue into ERCOT, into PJM, into NISO. And so partnering with folks like a foreman or a load that are able to provide that additional dynamic, that that refined, having that fidelity over your, your curtailment is has been very valuable, not just for us, for the miner management solution, for the Bitcoin miner, but extremely valuable for the grid and the community. So we're looking to add and expand upon that. We have over a gigawatt of um, enrolled capacity from our HPC miners and data centers. And hopefully by this point next year, we'll be at two gigawatts. I love that. I love that. And if someone's listening and they're a miner and they're not going to be able to make it to Nashville, but they do want to reach out to you. Where are the best places? Uh, LinkedIn, Twitter, you know, where are you basically checking DMs? Yeah, you can reach out to me on LinkedIn, K-A-M-T-O-W-E-R. You can shoot Compass a note, shoot C-Power a note, and we can we can get in touch and have a conversation. But uh, LinkedIn is, is a great resource. And if you're an on-grid miner or you know one, let, let's have a conversation. Great. And... Uh, thank you for hopping on today and talking about energy. And like I said, that was probably the best and easiest way for me to start to understand the environmental benefits outside of just, you know, playing well with the grid and getting competitive rates uh, around curtailment and the flexible load that is Bitcoin mining. Uh, if you're watching this on YouTube, please go ahead and subscribe. If you're listening to this on the podcast platform, please go ahead and subscribe. Follow us on social media on X, LinkedIn and YouTube at Compass Mining. Cam, I will see you in Nashville. And thanks again for hopping on the pod. Looking forward to it, Jarrett. This is a lot of fun. I'll see you in Nashville.